is just work through this Project 15 that I have just rewritten for Windows 2008 Server. And it is good, clean fun. So, the first thing you have to do, which see, the main problem with doing this on Windows 2000 Server instead of Windows 7 is that Microsoft puts a lot more defenses on Windows 2008 Server. And the thing that I didn't know the previous semester and a student found out towards the end of the semester is you can remove those defenses from your server. And the one that matters to us here is SE Hop. SE Hop is what checks the structure and section handler to make sure that none of those things are pointing somewhere stupid, which is totally what we're going to do. So I have to turn that off. And at the end of this project, I turned it back on again. So let me do that. That'll be kind of slow. Um, so let's get rid of this and get regedit. So it's run regedit, good. And it'll probably go. It goes right here to disable. There's this thing, HP local machine system, current control set, control session, manager, kernel. You can actually turn this on and off process by process in case you have one process that can't handle it. But you can also globally turn it off here with disable exception chain validation. Uh, that is currently not disabled, but I'm going to disable it by putting a one in there. And this will make my server act like a client except it just seems to freeze my mouse. All right, there we go. And now I have to restart it after that. So that's why I wanted to do it now, because restarting is pretty slow, both because servers are slow and also because Microsoft punishes us for not having product keys. All right, so what, that's going to come back. And that, now we're going to run this Vuln server software that somebody wrote that is wonderful. It has many different vulnerabilities in it. And the, um, I've combined two processes here. That's why I want to show you. The first thing you have to do is connect to this server and then fuzz it to find the vulnerability you want to have. And um, so, let me see if I can keep this moving at whatever speed it has. Um, when you, I think you've already been using this in other projects. You connect to it with Netcat on port 9999, and you have a series of commands here that looks reminiscent of an email server. And these are just meaningless commands, but they have values, and they each have different vulnerabilities, or some of them do. And in a previous semester, I had people fuzzing these and figuring out what all the vulnerabilities are. And I haven't been motivated to reproduce that project in its entirety. But we'll fuzz the gmon function here, which is the one we're going to exploit in this fashion. Um, let me just see how bad we are here. Got to wait another minute. All right. So we'll fuzz this thing. And um, I'll also skip a bit. If you just send ABC, it just says gmon started. It works. If you just send a lot of A's, it still doesn't crash. Um, and that's the wrong picture. My thing is fouled up. Anyway, on we go. So now you have to connect to Python. And one thing I discovered just by random chance before is this thing. You can send it as many letters as you want, and it will never crash. Um, you send it 100, send it 1,000, send it 20,000, it will never crash. It only crashes if you send it non-letter characters. And so the thing, I didn't bother trying many combinations to try to guess what it did. While I was trying to find the bad characters, I stumbled across this. The characters from 13 and 255 are good, a block of 242 characters. And if you send it a bunch of those blocks, it will crash. So some patterns of characters get through, and other patterns of characters don't get through. It is some kind of complicated input filter. But I don't care because I found something that will make it crash. And that's all I care about. So I'm going to skip ahead to this one, which is fuzz2. And maybe my server is up by now. It looks like it's nearly up. All right. Let me give it a little more kick. It'll take about another minute after this. It has to sit there black for about a minute and then give you a 15-second countdown to punish you for not having a product key. So if you send blocks of 252 or 242 characters, you can send 5 and it's fine, 10 and it's fine, 15 and it's fine. But if you send 20, it never answers because it's dead. So somewhere around 20 blocks of 242 characters is enough to overflow something and cause a crash. So the next thing is, boy, several of these images are totally wrong. I'm going to have to work on improving this. Um, I don't know what happened, but anyway. The, um, then uh, if it actually crashes between 16 and 17. Holy mackerel. Let me just try reload. I think what happened is my loading of images when it went slow and my server is guessing about sim images with similar names. Anyway, let's see if my server is back up yet. So I can do it live and that's oh, good. One whole second. Okay, good. All right, so now we can play games. Let's get the Vuln server up. It's in 127. Here, 127. There we are. Good. All right, Vuln, 127 Vuln server, Vuln server. Okay, this shows me it's now listening for client connections. Now, I have written a variety of attacks here. Let me just uh, terminate this nonsense. We won't need that until later. Uh, I'll use this in the meantime. OK. And that looks pretty big and visible. I think I can leave it that way. Uh, let me know if you can't see anything or if it's bugging you. 
All right, um, so I think fuzz 2 is about where we were. If you look at fuzz 2, fuzz 2 connects to the server, and then open, it opens a socket. And what I did to try to make this easier, which I wish I'd thought of in earlier semesters, is there's a part of this that is always the same. It connects to the server, and then it sends the attack. The only part that ever changes is here. So I label it, and that's the only part you need to worry about in the projects. So this is what creates stuff to send to the server and puts it in a variable called attack. So I'm going to take these strings, which have all the ASCII characters from 13 or 255, and just send a number of them, which I get from the user. So if I run fuzz2, how many strings? I send it 15 strings, and it says, you want to start it, goodbye, and it's fine. And you'll notice your server tells you, I got a connection, I serviced that connection, the connection closed, it didn't crash. So if I send, oops, to 16, same thing happens, but if I send 17, I keep hitting the wrong key, all right. Then it dies, and when it dies, Windows notices this, and it tells you something. And what it tells you is app crash, it crashed in ntdil.dil, and um, it has an exception offset and a locale ID and a couple of strange hexadecimal strings, and none of this really tells me much of anything worth knowing. But at least I know it crashed, so this is why we clearly need a debugger at this end so we can understand more of what happened to that crash. So let's quit running it on its own and run it in immunity. And so I'll just load that here. And in some of the earlier projects, in some earlier versions of immunity and earlier versions of Windows, it wouldn't reload a file properly. You had to close immunity and run the file, reattach to the process every time, which is the way some of the projects are written. Uh, now you don't have to do that. Now it's actually working to just reload the file over and over. So that's a lot more handy. So you load the file, and if I try to connect here to send my fuzz to, it, it's bad, it doesn't make it. Connection refused, why is that? That's right, it's not running. When you load something in a debugger, it's not running, it's paused. You gotta run it. I've been doing this for a long time and I still forget that at least 30% of the time. All right, so now you run it. So now I wanna send 17 because that's what made it crash. And let's see what we got here. What we got here is access violation writing to 00EE000. That's looking kind of funny. If you look up here in the stack, here's CC, CD, CE, CF. So we seem to control EDX. Because remember, what I'm sending is a string of ASCII characters counting up. Uh, 32, 32, 33, 34, 35. So that's part of my attack string. And nothing else here really. This is F8, FE, FC, FE. That's... Seems a little bit like my attack string, but not exactly. So I'm not quite sure what I've done. But what I have done is create an exception. So let's take a look at the exception handler. If you view the SEH, um, SEH chain, then you'll see 94, 95, 96, 97. So I do appear to be able to clobber the exception handler with some of my data. And it also causes an exception. So that's pretty handy. So it's going to try to go here. Now, it's not going to go there yet. So the pattern is going to be run your attack. Then immunity is going to say this to you. It's going to say an exception has occurred. Shall I handle it? And you send it a shift F7, shift F9, and it will run and jump to that exception and then crash because currently the exception handler is full of junk. But this is an SEH-based exploit. So that's one way to do it. We're going to control the SEH instead of the EIP. Another problem is we've got uh, address space layout randomization on, so we do not know where anything is, and it's going to change every time you reload. So let's get this ready to go again, which is now a lot easier. Debug, restart, yes, and run, and now it's ready to attack again. Okay, so let's uh, get the first version of a good attack here, which is going to be, um, I'm going to try, what I found was that 17 of these things will make it crash, so I'm going to take four of them away and just put in 968 A's at the end, hoping that I don't have to have this particular pattern of bytes all the time. So that would make my SEH1, let me spring that up, oh, I've got to go to the right place, yikes, let's cancel whatever that's doing, all right, nano, SEH1, all right, so the only thing that matters here is this attack section, so I'm going to have the same thing, I'm going to have 13 of them, and then I'm going to have as many A's as to add up to four of them. Each one is about 255, it's really 242 or something. So I've just taken the last bit, and let's make sure that works. Because my idea here is I'm trying to maintain the structure of this enough that the program will still crash and get some part of it I can manipulate. And what I want to put there is pointers and shellcode to take over the box. So when I run this one, um, over here I get 
of access violation, which is expected, and it says press shift seven, F789 to continue. If I continue with, um, oh, let's look at the uh, SEH chain. And the SEH chain now has 41, 41, 41, 41. So something in those 1,000 A's hit the SEH, which is good. And um, now, on top of that, I can see them up here, right here at ECX. ECX is pointing to it. And if I look at the stack, there's a return to vault server there. So let me go back to my instructions and let's see what I want to say about this beyond that. Um, all right, yeah, press shift out nine. Okay, now, since I know I'm at an exception, if I give it shift F9, it's going to attempt to run the exception handler. And that's going to access violate when trying to execute 41, 41, 41, 41. So I can execute code that's in the exception handler, which means I now control the EIP. All right. Um, so now I just want to find the bytes that target it exactly, and I struggled a bit. If you put in a bunch of repeating numbers, it no longer recognizes those numbers, and it doesn't crash anymore. So I had to do it in two stages. At one, I was sort of tempted to actually like go to um, Ida Pro and try to figure out exactly what this thinking function is doing, why it needs certain patterns of bytes, but I stuck to black boxing it. So instead of having one pass, I had to make two passes. I had about 1,000 bytes, so I made it into... Um, about 24 blocks of 40 characters, 40 A's, 40 B's, 40 C's, 40 D's, and so on, because they accepted it when they were all A's. So I figure letters are okay. So I ran that thing, and the SEH chain sh uh, shows you end up at 4A, 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 which is J. So now I know what part of it um, caused the crash, and then I had to take the J's and replace them with a pattern of characters, but now there's just 40 of them, I can just type them, A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, and so on. Now I have a non-repeating string of characters in that block, and when I run that one, then I can see I end up at this one, 414A4149. So I can find which characters that is, and um, it's this, the IAJA section hits. So I can finally target the SEH precisely, and that is this one, which I called SEH4. So let's run that one. This is, of course, um, the routine part that you've done for other ones. Get your server ready to attack again. You have to restart it every time, of course, because you have probably crashed it, and even if you haven't crashed it, you've probably done some damage confusing it, and you don't want to like start it in an uncertain state. So it's SEH4, I think, is what does that. Uh, you always get this message that you've got an exception, and you have to press Shift F9 to process the exception. And then I hit 42, 43, 44, 45, which was my goal. So let me look at the, um, that is D, E, F, G. If you nano S, E, H, 4. B, C, D, E, thank you. It's B, C, D, E. So this A's are the prefix. The B, C, D, E was what goes in the S, E, H. And here's the postfix, which is there just to keep my exploit string always the same length, which is just a habit I've developed. Um, it's, I don't know if it entirely helps in this case because of this weird problem hand processing the characters, but it's a good habit to always keep your attack the same length. So now I have control of this pointer, and I have um, two places where I could put shell code. I could put it up here where the X's are, or I could put it back there where the A's are. Now it's going to turn out that both of those are not viable choices. And it's pretty easy to see why if you go here, and um, I think maybe I should run the attack again. Let's see if it's time to show you that part. Um, all right, this is one, now, you, now you've this is proven, this is one to turn in because it shows you now control the EIP. Okay, now, yeah, I wanted to look at the stack pane. So let, at the point of the crash, the stack is down here. And here's how we're going to take over the box. Notice how there's some pointer to something here returning to something in NTDIL, some part of the Microsoft system. Here's something that just has junk in it and don't know its meaning, but this is pointing to the stuff I injected, A, 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 B, C, D, E, X, X, X. So... This is pointing to my attack. Now remember, I don't know where I am because of address space layout randomization. I can't jump to an address, but there is an address on the stack that points to stuff I executed, and I control this. So I could put an executable instruction where these A's are, and then jump to the third item on the stack, which means I need pop, pop, jump. I just need to find something that does that, pop, pop, return. And that is a fairly common pattern at the end of a function, so that's pretty easy to find. So I need to find pop pop return in the Microsoft code or somewhere I can use it. I need to jump to that address, and it will run pop pop return and jump to run this code. Now, yeah, go ahead. The stack that you're looking at right now, is that before the exception handler? That is oh. after the exception handler. Okay. 
and and but it is where the crash happens because if I wasn't running it in a debugger, the, it would not be pausing. It would have the exception, go to the exception handler, read my corrupt entry, and go there. Mm -hmm. And then it ends up here and crashes. So when it ends up here, um, yeah, I want to redirect execution to a pop, pop, return. Because I, and then it'll pop, pop, and return using this value and execute the contents I put on the stack. Now, there are a few other irritating problems. I can't change that BCDE. That's going to have to be the address to the pop, pop, return. So I only have four bytes to write my attack, which is not very much. But it's enough to make a jump, if it's a short jump. So I should digress a little bit into assembly language. Um, so first thing is to find the pop pop returns. And this is Mona, which I think you've already been using in previous projects. If you have Mona, you can look for modules that have a pop pop return in them, and it is extremely easy. You run Mona modules, and it will show you all the modules running on your system and how well protected they are. So let's run that. That is a good thing to know. Uh, first, you have to install Mona. If you haven't done that, it's just a Python script, and all you have to do is put it in the right directory where Immunity expects it to be. So bang Mona modules. Shows me the modules, and let me see if I've got them as pretty as I can make them, because, it, okay, it's as pretty as they're going to get. All right, so every module starts somewhere, base, top, and size. Remember, in the past, we got all upset about addresses that had too many zeros in them, because we were going to have to put that address literally in an attack string, but that doesn't matter anymore. We're not going to do that. We can have all the zeros we want. What we're, so it doesn't really matter where it is. What matters is how protected it is. And see, most of these have ASLR turned on, which means they're jumping all over the place. But this ESS func and Vuln server itself don't. So if inside those functions I can find pop pop return, I can take over the box with it. And to do that, what you do is you redirect the Mona logs to go to a folder you can find, and then you run Mona ROP. And Mona ROP will hunt for common attack strings of like three different types because there's only a few things you want. There's, um, and the one we want here is it's called a stack pivot, pop, pop, return. And when you run it, it finds pop, pop, return of various different kinds. It doesn't really matter what kind of pop it is. It pops hops and throws this somewhere, pops and throws this somewhere, and then return will jump to the next address on the stack. And it finds it at all these locations, like 10 or 15 locations in that function. Any of them will do. I just chose the first one. So this is the address we want to put in the structured exception handler. And when it crashes, it will go to a pop pop return, and that will try to execute the code on the stack, which is pretty awesome. So we're going to test the stack pivot attack. And the way we're going to do it is take the four A's and turn them into interrupts so I can see when I get there, and put that number down here. Remember, the number that Mona found was 6250.10b4. And you have to put it backwards, 6250.10b4. So this mess is SEH5. And let me just clean up my... By the way, when you messed up immunity, the cure is to view the CPU window and maximize it. And then you're back to a normal look. So debug, restart, and then run. And this server is ready for another attack. And I think it's SEH5. Yeah, okay. So let's look at... Uh, SEH5. All right, here's the active ingredient of SEH5. It's got this same old block of characters that causes the crash. I'm going to have 13 of them, then 373 A's, then four int C's, where I used to have A, 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 and then these four bytes where I used to have B, C, D, E, and then just junk at the end, X's at the end. So that should work. Let's try it, SEH5. Okay, it goes to the server. It causes an exception. The server says access violation, press shift F7 or 8 or 9. I press shift F9 to continue executing. And then it ends up here at an interrupt, which is what I was hoping. And if I scroll back a bit, you can see this is exactly what I hoped for. This is the A's I put in. These are the four C's I put in. This is that address. 62, 58, 50, 10, B, 4, some of this, for these bytes of the address, which the debugger is misinterpreting as some kind of assembly, and this is all the X's I put at the end. So this is my attack, and it really did go and execute the first byte here, which was an interrupt, which let me see it, which is a very useful trick. I had great trouble, there's like 10 of these things, around 6 or 7 I have stuck for like a whole day, until I realized I can put CC's in myself, which will cause it to break halfway through, so I can see what I'm getting wrong which is very handy. 
And by the way, I can just continue to test it now. If I can run F7, and as long as it'll do the CC and the next CC and go on. So anyway, that's going to be useful later. Right now, all I know is I got to this point, and it didn't say can't execute it. It's quite happily executed the int3. So the stack is executable, which is handy. All right. So let's get this thing ready. Oh, I think I'm ready now to look at the problem of where to put my shell code. I can, um, so this is the area where I started executing. Let's look at that area in the um, dump. Follow that in the dump, and it's down here in just the plain hex viewer. And here we're going to be able to see some important stuff. If I can make my window a little bigger. Come on, come on. Okay. And this one as well come down. Ah, I'll forget that part right now. It doesn't matter. All right, this is big enough. Make it wider if I can. There we go. All right. So this is the CCCCCCC. Here's that address. And here's where I have like 500 X's at the end. Well, it turns out those 500 X's aren't doing me any good at all. It's only about 50 of them go in, and the rest are going off the end into unaccepted, outside this block of memory. So I don't have room to put shell code down here unless I use really lame shell code that's only 20 bytes big. You need about three or 400 bytes to really send a reverse shell or something cool. So let's try putting the shell code up here. And if you look up here, there's plenty of room. Plenty of, you know, I happen to know that's a, um, about three or 400 A's. I made it that way. So there's plenty of room there for the shell code. So what I have to do now is somehow get backwards about 350 bytes. Okay, so now let's talk about assembler. Let's get this ready for the next one before I leave debug, restart, and then play. All right. So back to here. Um, all right. If you look up online, now you could um, use uh, a compiler to do this for you, but it turned out to be about as more confusing than actually understanding it. These are all the x86 jump codes. There really aren't very many. Um, and remember, these are ones that jump to absolute addresses. And I can't use any absolute addresses because I don't remember. Absolute are numbers that just change. The kind we used in our first exploits, where you find a location on the stack and you jump to that location. We need a relative jump, and there are only three relative jump instructions. This one has an 8-bit, uh, one byte amount to jump. This one has two bytes, and this one has three bytes. This one looked pretty attractive, but you can't use it on modern machines. It's only used when you have a 64 processor running, a 32-bit processor running in 16-bit mode to run MS-DOS code. And that's not where we are. So there are only two jump instructions available. EB will jump. It's a two-byte instruction. EB and then a one-byte word will do a short jump relative to where you are. It can only go 128 bits forward or 127 backward, or else it's the other way, because you only have one byte there to play with. So you can only jump a short distance, but the command is small. The only other choice you have is this one, which is a five-byte instruction, E8, and then four bytes of a distance to jump. And that can jump anywhere, but it's a five-byte instruction, and I can't fit it in that room where I only have four bytes to work with. So the winning strategy is this one down here. The You have to put shell code before the SEH bytes, insert a pop-pop ret into the structure, structure exception handler. That will jump to the four A's. In there, you have to put in a jump rel 8 command that will jump back 10 bytes. And there, you have to put a jump rel 32 that will jump back 350 bytes. You have to do it in stages, like bouncing off a trampoline. And the cool thing, which I was very happy I finally got working this morning, is if you fill everything with CC instead of NOP, then you can see it in the debugger. And that helps a lot because I kept getting it wrong, of course. Um, so the one that does this junk is SEH6. Let's take a look at that. All right. Um, so nano SEH6. That'll help if I spell it right. Yeah. Command line commands. OK, so here's the active ingredient of this one. The same old thing. I got this same block of junk and 13 of those just to make an attack. OK, then I put in CC times 365 um, so that if I ever do jump to the real shell code, it'll just break and let me know I got there. And here's what I put here. Here is the jump 350. This will jump back 350 characters. It is an E9, and this number is minus 350 in hex, plus 2, because it counts relative to the next EIP. There's a, well, anyway, so if you know negative is in hex, negative numbers start out with FFFF, and positive numbers starts out with 0, 0, 0, 0. It's called the twos complement. So all Fs is minus 1. And if an E at the end, it's minus 2, and you count backwards. So Fe is minus 256, and A2 is minus about 60 times 16. So it's about 350, this mess. 
So this will jump back 350 bytes. This one will jump back, um, EBF6 will jump back eight bytes. And I've just used CCs before each of these to pad them up to the right length so that the SEH will hit the right point because the total number of bytes before the SEH must always be constant. Remember, I'm overflowing a buffer and there's a magic four bytes to hit the SEH and it's got to be right. And this is my laughable 587 to keep the length the same when by now I know that almost all of those 500 are being discarded anyway, but it doesn't matter. Yeah? You don't need those CCs in there, so you're putting it padding? Right. This could just as well be A still. I'm putting it there for later because I'm intending to optimize this later, so I jump back there, and then I want to CC so I see it got back there. Those are never going to be executed yet. <coughs> Although, actually, um, they will be executed. You'll see. Because after this is all done, this is going to jump back 350, and I want to see where it goes. Uh -huh. So this is actually all going to be used. All right. So that's the attack. Now let's run SEH6. Um, this thing should crash, and it didn't, so what's the problem? Mm. Close program. Paused. It's paused. It's not running. How rude. But why didn't it complain? Access violation. All right, let's try Shift F9 and see if something good happens. It did happen. Okay, good. I know something went a little bit off the track there, but it doesn't seem too important, so off we go. We are now in what I hope to be familiar territory. Here is the stack that I jumped into. I hit the N3. Here's the jump short, and with F7, I can go forward step by step, which I love. So, um, F7, I do the now I do the jump short. That puts me back there. Now I do the jump long. That puts me back here. And if I scroll up, I'll see I'm right about near the end. This, is, this here is the, the sequence of characters, F8, F9, F8, FB. That's the end of those blocks of characters that makes it crash. So these are the characters I inserted, and I made it back approximately to the beginning of those, maybe 15 or 20 down. So now, all I have to do is put a NOP sled here and shell code here, and I'm in. Now, there are a few nasty problems. For some ungodly reason, which I really don't understand, I tried to make simple listening shell code to just listen on port 4444. And if you do that on Windows Server, if you do that on Windows 7, it works fine. If you do it on Windows Server 2008, it will listen, and when you connect, it will not execute any commands. As soon as you execute a command, it'll crash, because all the, the commands you give to the command prompt are run by Windows internal system routines, and all of those have data execution prevention turned on, and you can't turn it off. So they keep on crashing and stopping. So I wondered what I did, and I said, how did I ever exploit this thing? Anyway, I went back to 123, where you do it with the social engineering toolkit. For some reason, a reverse metriperter shell works when a command shell does not work. And my hypothesis, which is a little more than a guess, is that the interpreter actually wrote everything themselves, and it's in their code. It's not using the system code, which would have catch this attack. But anyway, that's what I did. You have to use the more complicated attack, which phones home, because that's the other ones will not run. So um, here's the attack I chose that actually worked is MSF Venom we're using to make our shell code is Windows Meterpreter Reverse TCP. So you have to have a command and control server listening, and it will phone to that server and then do a Meterpreter commands. And that turned out to be 360 bytes, which is just, which is almost as much as I could possibly put in, but it works. <coughs> now, I could have gone back and had less blocks of that uh, 242 box stuff to make room, but it wasn't really necessary. So you take this code and put it in instead of that other stuff. So let's take a look at our, um, let me get this ready to go again. Debug, restart, and run. And here, we did SEH6. Take a look at that. Whoops, must have done something wrong. Drill X, H6. All right, we were at this one where we had the jump 8 and the jump 350, and we had 365 bytes here. Now we're going to pick 360 bytes of shellcode and have only five left for the NOP sled, but it doesn't really matter because there is no randomness. We really don't even need the NOP sled at all if we were precise. So that's SEH7, and here's how it goes. Here's your attack. You put in the buffer, which is just the Python written by Metasploit to make a reverse shell in 360 um, bytes, and then you have room for a NOP sled of 365 minus this, which is going to turn out to be 5. So you have a few NOPs. You have the buffer itself, and then you have the jump 350 back and the jump 8 back and the SEH in the post. So that's the attack, and that's SEH7. If I, and I did it wrong again. Okay, so if I run that, something happened over here, 
And what happened to better B, it hit an exception and it wants me to get Shift F9 to process the exception, so I'll do that. And when I do, I end up hitting these ints which I left there so we can see what's happening. So here's the game now, here's my stack. I got the two ints I put in, here's the jump short, here's the jump long, here's the end of that shell code. And here's a few leftover CCs padding it. So the shell code that Metasploit wrote is 360 bytes going back from there. So let's proceed with F7. I think I can make this a little bigger. Yeah, F7. All right, now it does the short jump. Now it does the long jump. And scrolling back, I can tell I'm screwed. I did not hit the knob sled because it's too tight. I missed. You may remember I had about 10 or 15 bytes of knob. And now I only got five bytes of knob, so I'm jumping into the middle of my op hack, and you can't do that. You gotta jump right at the start. So I need to move back. So how far do I need to move back? Well, the EIP is FE66, and that is um, FE66. It's around here, but I need to be back here, like FE50. So I need to move back by one six hexadecimal from where I am. So I'm going to 66 back to 50. So to move back by one six hexadecimal, I need to take my jump. Let's go back into my Kali. Um, this was SEH7 that we just did. All right. The thing I have to change is the long jump. Instead of jumping 350, I need to jump 350 plus one six hexadecimal. This is the size of the jump, FFFFFEA2. It's a negative number. The one bit of zero here means 256. This is the rest from A2 up to FF. So to go back 10, I should make 92. To go back 20, I would do 82. And it's one six hexadecimal, I have to add A, so it turns out to be 9A goes here, or eight, I think it's 8A, it goes in there. So let's go here. Um, that's all you have to do to make SEH8, is change that one byte to, oh, 8C. All right, I, I got it wrong a few times, of course, and through trial and error, finally found the right value. Um, so 8C is what chain makes that jump a little bit longer, like 365 or 375 or something instead of 350. So let's try that one. Uh, debug, restart, yes, and run, and run SEH8, I have to spell it right. All right, now it complains that I have to have handle the exception, so shift F9. Now I end up where I hoped to be at the instructions I've inserted onto the stack. So let's watch this one go with F7. I jump short. I do the big jump, and now I hit the knobs. Now, if I continue, yeah, we're getting it. If I continue, it's going to phone home, and there's nobody listening, and because it's crappy shell code, it's going to crash. So before continuing, <laughs> let's go start the listener. Now, the way you listen for Metasploit Meterpreter shell code is you run MSF um, CLI. All right, I've already forgotten what you hit. Let's use it. There, MSF console. All right, MSF console. Uh, because a meterpreter shell code doesn't just have a simple listening port at the other end, it's got something a little more complicated. So you tell it which exploit you're using, which is um, use exploit multi handler, and then you exploit. Because the meterpreter shell code is staged, it doesn't all happen at once. It has to connect, and with it, first of all, there's a downloader, then it has to download more from the server, then it can run. So now I am listening. Um, I think, oh, it's way down there. I didn't mean to make it so big. Somehow I fouled up my beautiful screen layout here. All right, so now, now it's starting the reverse payload handler. Okay, now it's listening on port 4444, which is the default. All right, so now if I continue, it will phone home to my command and control server, which is now properly listening. So let's carry on with F7 here to do nop, nop, nop. Now I better hit F9 because I want it to run all that junk, hundreds of shellcode instructions that somebody else wrote. F9, it runs, it's still running, and it's phoning home, getting the stage, getting the second stage. Now I have my interpreter, and I can do things like sysinfo and help. And as you may remember from 123, you can snap the screenshots and turn on a keylogger and turn on the camera and the microphone and all that good stuff. So now you own the box. This isn't a direct shell to the machine. This is a reverse shell. Which but is. You're not executing commands. Or... You are. You're executing commands on that Windows box. If I do screenshot, it will take an image of the screen and put it here, 
and I can then view it. Okay, but that's a Metasploit. That's a Metasploit feature. Yes, I can also descend to a normal command shell and execute normal command shell commands. If I do, it'll probably crash because that's what it's failing for. But it's kind of interesting to see. I think it's shell. Is it shell? Yeah. Now I can do who am I? Yeah, apparently it's working. I don't know why I couldn't do that directly. Somehow if I do it through Meterpreter, it works. And it's simply laziness that makes me not know the answer because if you're in debuggers, you can figure everything out. If you ever feel like I can't figure this out, you're wrong. We have access to exactly what it's doing. Just the question is if you want to put in the time. But like when I first, there's the other interpreter shell load. By the way, I've used other interpreter shell code that this would not work on because I only had five bytes of knob. Some of the other interpreter shell code actually uses the bytes before the start of it as a scratch pad and wipes things out. And I've, when I hit that, I said, I can't figure this out. And I said, wait a minute, I've got a debugger. I can figure anything out. <laughs> and I made it step through it step by step and then play it like a movie so I could see that it was actually going outside of its boundary and messing with other things. So it's recommended to have a 16-byte NOP sled before any interpreter shell code. But this particular interpreter shell code doesn't do that. Don't ask me why. Anyway, so now it works. Now the only thing is it could be cleaned up a bit. Like right now it's full of interrupts, so it won't actually run on the real code. It'll only run inside the debugger where you have F7. So that's kind of sleazy. Um, but um, that's easy enough to fix. So the next version of it is, um, go back to here. Let's see, let me, let me re restart this. Debug, restart, and then play. Now it's ready to go again. That means interpreter has been hung up on. And by the way, I found this out the hard way. It does not continue to listen. How rude. You close your session, so you have to have an exploit again. I think if you're on exploit minus J, it will keep listening. But anyway, now it's listening again. So we can try the next one here, which is SEH9. And this one here, I think I just put knobs in everywhere instead of, yeah. Now, instead of those CCs, I put in 90s. So it will just execute this, and I put 90s in the NOP sled where I should instead of CCs. So now there is no more of that CC nonsense. And so this one I can attack, and it should um, run with only one break because the uh, debugger, well, let's run it, SEH9. And let's get the other window visible so we can see if it works. And let's get down to the bottom. Okay. And this one here, so now I've run it, and again, Process terminated. How rude. Um, let's just restart this thing. And I should probably just run it without the debugger anyway. That'd be more fun. But let's, uh, okay, there it is running. Now what's going? Oh, it did make the Okay, it was going. Okay, thanks. All right, so it worked. Um, I thought it was going to um, ask me to press Shift F9. But anyway, regardless, I don't need the debugger anymore. Now I can just run Vuln Server directly, which is 127, Vuln Server, Phone server, right? This is the way real servers are. Hey, come on. Oh, neat, and it dies. Perhaps this junk is killing it. No? Perhaps this junk is killing it. All right. Let's find out what's happening here. Perhaps the previous one is tying up a port or something? Uh, well, let's see what task manager has. To. Whoa, okay, that's, that's something, all right. Um, <laughs> let's see if we have app running, you say. That's just the folder. Processes. Uh, you know, I might wonder if it's tied up the network socket. If you, if you close the socket improperly, it can take time to close. Let's try that. Netstat minus n pipe find string 9999. Yeah, uh, one of those things, I killed the connection to Vuln server and it's hogging up this port until this times out. Wait, it's listening. It's still running somehow. How rude. All right. So if I should see it in Task Manager then. But I should see it. So this is really running then, you think? End task? I don't think, I think that was just the window. That was just the window showing it to me. So where is, let's try if there's a phone server process here. Uh, and is there? I don't see one. You know, now, this is a modern version of Windows. I have Resource Monitor. Resource Monitor should tell me exactly who's listening on that port. And it should be able to get there from here. Um, all right, I, I get it from the search then. I don't know where they hide it. Resource. Resource Monitor. You can? Good, because this is totally not working. Okay, let's try run and do Resmon. 
I did not know that. That's a good thing to know. Supposedly. Windows cannot find, maybe Server 2008 didn't have it. Um, well, the other way to do it is to get the process ID here with a switch. That can be done. I think it's dash PID or something. Um, let's make this window smaller so I can see what's going on. Um, make, all right. There's a way to get the process ID of the process. Um, display the routing table. I can just restart the whole machine, but that'll take a while. It's a, kind of wimpy. Displays the executable. Benstat minus B. Okay, netstat minus A and B. Okay, shows me that it's listening and doesn't show me the executable. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, there's, but it should, there is a way to get it to show me the process. Uh, minus T minus I minus S minus P. Minus O displays the process ID. Okay, we'll use minus O and see if that works. I think that one actually works. That's A-O-N is what I'm used to doing, actually. A-O-N. I know it's coming back to me from my old Windows uh, days. Yes, so it's 3428 is the process. Now, you can get the process number in Task Manager. 3428 is what's locked in, and there we are. 3428 is not on the list. Well, now we're in deep trouble, yeah. <laughs> PS? Oh, to show the processes. Um, there is, uh, yeah. Well, now, okay, we got to restart the machine. There's no kill. Is there, is there a kill? I don't think there is. Because like missing PID. Well, let's try it. Kill. Let's try that. Kill. I never knew there was a kill in Windows. 3428. Let's try it. 3428. Uh, now let's see. Netstat did not do it. And I'm running as an administrator. I don't think there's kill dash nine. Uh, let's see what. The <laughs> let's see. There is kill dash f. Okay. <laughs> let's try that. Kill dash f. You learn something new every day. Let's see if that did it. No. Did not kill it. We got to restart the machine. <laughs> Can you look at the again? Look at what? Sorry. Look at what again? Scroll over to the side. Yeah. Okay. Thirty four twenty is still going. Task kill. All right. Uh, space forward slash whatever that one F slash oh I probably used a slash okay then the number uh, or something uh, else slash invalid option okay I think you have to but actually it occurs to me I didn't do this right in Microsoft it's this okay that's not doing it well, let's try task kill I like this task kill minus or slash question mark okay task kill pid and slash t you wonder what that is okay so task kill slash f slash pid okay let's try it task kill um slash pid and the number is 3428 i think and slash f not found okay maybe am i wrong That could be 3428. Yeah, I think so. So, like I say, uh, what check what? Oh, this thing? Yeah. So, we managed to create a hung process, and you got the right attitude. If we got all the Sysmon tools and all that crap, there ought to be some way to track it down. But. That's a good idea. That might be easier. That should do it too. It should have been running as me. That would seem better. Also, in the time that we did this, we probably could have just restarted it. Well, that's always the case, though. I mean, it's a matter of pride, right? Restart takes so long, though. But see, well, it often takes you a lot longer to do it the smart way, but it's fun. This is like why you do CTFs. I mean, you could have just restarted it, but you know, why are we here? Yeah. We could just walk in your house and hit you with a hammer and steal your computer. We don't need to learn how to hack, but we're here because we want to do things the cool way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So let's see if that got rid of it. Logging out, logging in again. That's certainly easy. Netstat. 
I don't. Um, find string, but there's not that much useful in my history anyway. Good, that did it. All right, so now I can finally run my malware, or my vulnerable server, which is not exactly malware, but it is vulnerable. So all I wanted to do was run this, and now it's running, okay. It's running as administrator, everything else. Well, the, the program name, is it run as vulnerable? It's vulnerable.exe, yeah. And so I run this, and now it should have come to my listing process, which I forgot to restart, and I probably have to restart now. I think I have a few seconds to restart oh. it before it'll freak out. Yeah, and now I think, after about 30 seconds, it seems to connect in my previous attempts. Uh, if not, I could exploit it again but I think it will eventually connect. Yep, it does. So I think the, the, it's either just a natural Windows delay or the or, MS, or Metasploit thing actually wrote that to try again every now and then. Yeah? In Metrpreter, how do you show your sessions or whatever? Oh, it's um, not in Metrpreter, but you can do sessions minus L to list them and session minus I one to connect to one or two or three. But when you're in Metrpreter, you're already connected to one. You're in a session. Yeah, okay. but I could, there's a way to like put this one in the background and go to another. Yeah. And there's a way to migrate this session out of this process into another process, because right now it's in like um, it's in this vuln server process, and that might be crashing. So if it's like in your browser, you want to move to something else like Explorer or Notepad or something. Yes, I mean once you got this, you can go in the box. And so the other thing, which I think I'm not going to bother demonstrating, of course, is if you go back and undo that registry change um, here. So you turn on se hop again, then none of this will work because that checks the structured exception handler for corruption and kills it if you corrupted the exception handler. And I wonder how perfect it is and if we could figure out a way to trick that, and probably is a way, but anyway, that was enough for one long project. So if you, if you turn that back on and run the exploit, then it will say this debug program was unable to process exception. Yeah? So you know how often that it runs the, the uh, checker? Um, I think every time you handle an exception, it checks the the thing to make sure it's corrupted before using it. Just like the canary checks every time you're gonna well, trust. Smart. Yeah, and I think that's what, but I don't really know all the details. And, and I'm sure there are attacks against it, but, but it stops this attack anyway, yeah. Do you know if Windows 10 has this SE hop or not? I don't know for sure, but I believe I've caught on to Microsoft's philosophy, which is that they turn all this stuff off on the clients because it all breaks legacy code. And clients like to use legacy code. They turn it on on the server because it's more important and they're willing to harass you about legacy code on the server. And they, if you want to add these to the client, what Microsoft wants you to do is to install Emmet, the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit. Now there was talk about the next version of Windows, Server 2016 having Emmet built in. Emmet adds all these protections even to the client and breaks a lot of legacy code. So you can actually do quite a lot by just setting it, but Microsoft has a whole set of, of really powerful defenses that it can't really run on a client without breaking a bunch of legacy code, and that's usually not what they want. But um, I haven't tested on Windows 10. It would be interesting to try, especially since Windows 10 keeps changing on us. Even if you find the answer next month, it'll be different. Yeah? So if EEP is turned on for this process, can we just do a pure ROP-based attack without using any like, uh, code on staff? Yes, you can, and we'll do that. There's a project here that is defeating DEP with ROP, um, and that is uh, this one here, Project 11. You will do that. All you do is you just go to a different result from Mona, which lists an attack. And what the attack does, of course, is it turns off the NX bit on the stack. So then you can execute it. Uh, I don't know any attack that will do that because it would be very painful because shellcode is very different. The, you, you could certainly do that, but you might have to write your own. The, what, what Mona does is it just does like three or four common activities. And one of them, I think, actually allocates a new block of memory to put your shellcode in that has the permissions you need. And that's a pretty good idea. I guess I know on iOS, this is like not possible Yeah, yeah. Yes, on iOS it's difficult, you're right. And, uh, there was a guy I met at RSA who had said he had written one. He was sort of horrified when I told him Mona already existed to do this. But you can, I mean, Mona's just a Python script and you can modify it and stuff. And there's a bunch of other advanced scripts we talked about at the end of Immunity. There may be something like this that will actually build your entire shell code out of ROP gadgets. 
Anything else? Well, I'm going to stop the recording. And I'll go to the lab, help anybody who wants to work on things. This is uh, 126, Project 15. All right.